performance. It was interesting to see him go with the five at the back and certainly start Cavani and Ronaldo up front. Um, but Spurs were just there for the taking. No shots on target. Albeit, yeah, United played very well. They pressed from the front. Obviously, when they got the goal ahead, then they could you know, soak up a little bit more pressure. But Spurs just... It was just a bad fit, wasn't it, really, with Nuno? Um, it just didn't work out. And, you know, now they've gone and they've acted and they've gotten Conte. So you'll be expecting them to, you know, come fight. And probably he'll need some time to obviously get the balance of the squad and whatever. But, you know, United were always going to react well. David yeah. said that uh, he got it, you got to play uh, Matic and Ronaldo. And I was saying, like, you can't. How can you play, like, two players with such little <laughs> mobility in the team? Like, And not only did he do that, David, but he also threw Cavani into the mix and they won 3-0. I know. Um, <laughs> it is It is fascinating to think, like, you know, with Ronaldo being, you know, 36, Cavani being 34. Like, Cavani is such an example for any young boy or girl who wants to make a, you know, a living or a career in professional sport, not just, you know, soccer or football, whatever way you want to call it. Like, his level of professionalism, his work rate, his attitude, like, his endeavour. You look at him the other day, chasing balls down, chasing players down, everything. Um and it was it, it was a big call for Molly, um, you know, to start and lead the line with those two. Like the biggest thing he has now is he's so many attacking good players. You look at Jaden Sancho, this you know spent seventy plus million. Where does he fit into a five three two? You know, then you've got you know Marcus Rashford with three goals in I think it's one hundred and seventy odd minutes in the games he's played since he's been back. He, he do you know what Johnny? There's plenty there's plenty of games for these players, but how Ollie's going to find the balance now? Because I'd expect them to, you know, see this through and continue on with the five because they had such a good performance. The, the, sorry, Richie. Yeah, the, the Cavani thing is intriguing because I think Solskjaer spoke about this as well, David. That um, he was he was just so impressive and inspiring during the week in training that he he went on to mention it. And I don't know, is it kind of a Uruguayan trait? And I know Suarez mm. is a completely different player, but they have it built into them from a very early age. They want to win and they want to play football. That's It's just, it's such a, a massive part of their DNA. And Cavani is, he's, he really is inspirational at 34 to be doing that. Um, after being more or less rumoured to be leaving, I, I think it's interesting that he was seemingly an inspiration to the rest of United players when they needed it during the week in training. Yeah, that's, but they're the, they're the kind of stories you want to be hearing. Mm. Um, like we we saw the likes of Gary Neville coming out saying, this is where you want to hear Harry Maguire. After the Liverpool loss, I'm talking about now. You want to see Harry Maguire step out you know, and speak, which he did. You want to hear Ronaldo. You want to you know hear these big characters. Cavani's another big character of the game. He's been around a long time. He's had great success across Europe. Now he finds himself at United. And I imagine he is a big voice in the change room. I'd say there's no nonsense with him. I'd say he's like a top, well, he has to be a top professional to be, you know, going the way he is at 34. And I'd say the way he conducts himself on and off the pitch and, you know, as Ali came out in training, like the way his endeavour and everything. Like, I think there was a there was a clip that went viral. I think it was Villarreal. Um, if you remember, Ronaldo kind of stopped when the ball, I think it was my pal Matic who played one down the line. And Ronaldo kind of stopped and turned his hands, kind of going like, well, I'm not really running down. And Cavani sprinted 40 yards across the pitch, you know, try and keep the ball in to keep United on the attack. Um, but like you said there, you used the example of Suarez, like Liverpool fans, of course, know the way he, you know, what he did for Liverpool and his work rate, his endeavour. It's just, I remember like, like you hear different things and I was reading things and like they say they get really upset when they don't win the five sides in training. There's uproar. But that's that level of hunger in them that it's, they've never lost that since they were a kid. And, you know, that's, he really is a breath of fresh air. Even like last season before Ronaldo was here, I remember watching various different clips of him playing, being on off the ball, saying like, like I don't care what level you're playing at. If you're an under eight or nine boy or girl, or if you're, you know, a senior player, you could learn so much from Cavani. With, you know, his work rate, his movement, um, how clever he is. He's an exceptional player. It's up to the, the the rest of the players and the younger players then to take that baton on because, you know, a pacemaker will actually only last so long in a race before he actually lets him, whoever is trying to attempt a record or trying to attempt and win the race, uh, go and do it themselves. Like, they're not there for the duration um, at the front of the field. Similarly, it's not a sustainable option for Solskjaer to have two lads in their mid-30s uh, running, you know, uh, running their legs to stumps for 90 minutes up front uh, against top-level opposition week in and week out. We've seen, you know, obviously rotation a little bit tonight. He almost has to start Ronaldo. Rashford's come in uh, to start instead of Cavani. You'd imagine we might see Cavani back in for the game against Manchester City at the weekend. But what you need is a performance from someone like Solskjaer tonight to show that they actually 
are being raised, their standards are being lifted by someone like Cavani and someone like Ronaldo and what they're showing on the training pitch? Well, everything with Manchester United is always like overblown. Everything's taken way out of proportion. Like after the Liverpool result, it was the worst thing in the world. Um, obviously, it was, a, it was a bad loss. Then they kind of go to Spurs and they, they beat them 3-0. Like, it, it's so interesting now because I'm, the team that Ali has selected tonight, obviously Pogba's coming back in. I know he's suspended the Premier League. As you said, Rashford's come in. Um, there was something wrong with Vinder Lind- Victor Lindelof that he didn't travel to buy ease in. But it's like, he now has so many players that anyone who kind of steps in has to perform. Um, I expected a, like a massive performance from them against Spurs. But now you've got to follow it up tonight. We saw the, you know, the difficulties that Antalanta gave them the last time. And then, of course... I don't care who you are. They still they're going to have one eye on Manchester City at the weekend. Um, it's got to be in the back of their minds because Manchester City are different total, you know, different type of you know team to Liverpool or Spurs. So they're going to be one eye on that as well as as you said there, like Cavani, will he start? So the ones who've come in, I really have to put their hand up and put a performance in because their manager is under pressure. There's a lot of people are calling, for, you know, for him to lose his job. Albeit you know, the one that they wanted was Conte, and he's obviously gone to Tottenham. So it's like, where do you go from here? But you know, United need to start putting a string of results together. It can't be just individual moments of brilliance from players. Certainly, even if you look at the goal Ronaldo got the other day, it's an incredible, you know, bit of vision from Bruno to spot him, the way to the pass, and then Ronaldo's technique to score. Like, that's a moment of brilliance. But then the rest of it was a real team performance where they saw it through and they, you know, when the opportunities arose, they counted well and they punished them. You said he almost has to start Ronaldo. Surely not tonight, though, because in between those two games, like where he will start, um, I, I think I think the pressure is such that he has to keep What's starting. The Fergie comment, like I don't know if it's the Fergie comment or if it's just the sheer weight of personality, or whatever. But you know, it'd be interesting to get your take on that, David. More more than mine, because mine doesn't matter. Like a player of that stature, and given everything that Cristiano Ronaldo stands for in terms of Manchester United, the club. And the effort they went to to bring him back on on deadline day, they, I can see the merits, and I I, I think it was before the Liverpool game was saying that I, I could see the merit in him not starting, uh, but in this instance and where they are now, it's almost like they can't let him be dropped to the bench or they can't let him be rested. If you look at any of any of the big players um, over the last ten or fifteen years, um, they never really are rested. If you look at Salah, Salah always seems to play. The only time he ever really gets a rest is the League Cup where Jurgen like tends to, you know, like gutter the whole squad and play a load of youngsters and then he brings in the lads who hardly ever feature for Liverpool in the Premier League. So I don't think there is a case for Ronaldo being dropped. He is their main man, he is their goal scorer. You know if you get three, four, five chances in a game, Ronaldo's going to take two or three of them. Like that's the thing. Ronaldo just loves the headlines. He loves scoring goals. Doesn't matter what type of goal it is. Like there's, this is the great one, obviously, for us Irish people was, you know, the game against um, Ireland played against Portugal. Ronaldo did nothing for probably 89, 90 minutes. And then all of a sudden he pops up and he bangs two headers and it's kind of like, well, hold on a minute, I am playing. And that's what he has and that's what he can bring. Like, Solskjaer needs to find a balance. Now, he's he looked like he's he's obviously tinkering and we're going with the five at the back. So that, it will be interesting to see how Pogba plays, for argument's sake, because now there's not as much defensive discipline needed with him because they've got three centre-halves. So he can afford to kind of get forward. We saw that with McTominay's performance the other day, carrying the ball forward more. So going back to your original thing, I don't think he can afford to leave Ronaldo out. Because I'm thinking if he can get enough chances and they can create, Ronaldo will take will take those chances and he will score goals. Does this formation that they've lapsed into now almost sort a lot of, well, at least some of the problems that they'd had? Because... You were asking a lot of Fred McTominay to sit in front of the back four and try and uh, screen things for them and you weren't necessarily getting the best use out of Bruno Fernandes whereas now and looking at the way the team is probably going to line up tonight you've got Fernandes sitting in behind that front two you've got uh, McTominay and Pogba in midfield and you've got a solid back three that can essentially provide cover for one another and, and a lot of United's issues look to have been sorted by that formation but is this a sustainable one? It is sustainable. You look at, you know, Thomas Tuchel's done it with Chelsea, so there's no reason why it can't be sustainable. Now, you'll be able to pick faults at United playing a back five. Um, like, they'd need to address the, the right wing back spot. wan is a fantastic 1v1 defender, but he's not he's not a Manchester United calibre fullback going forward. You look at Rhys James, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Kyle Walker to a certain extent. Those players are ahead of him in that category. Um 
that will be a major downfall for them. Luke Shaw will be fine on their side. Like you, you highlighted um, Mc, uh, McTominay and Fred. There has been questions over them, um, certainly in their you know defensive duties. Um, you know everybody's kind of crying out for Manchester United to sign an outright number six. Um, but with three and a half, you have that added cover where one of them can afford to step in. The other two, you know, narrow round. If one gets dragged wide, the other two just shift across. It does add a bit of you know defensive stability. But at the same time, how often have we seen Ali use that? We haven't. He has tinkered and you know tried to use it in the past, and he's gone back to his original four-two-three-one or four-three-three, whichever way you want to cut it up. So it's whether or not he's going to see this through and stick out with it. If he does, at least he can then work with the players and consistently use it, and he can mold players into positions. Um, because this formation should allow Pogba to be able to be more creative. It should allow Bruno to not worry about you know tracking back and having to do defensive works. He, he inevitably should have a free role where he can go and appear all over the pitch and try and create. Um, it would be certainly interesting to see how they go forward, whether or not they'll do it you know, for the rest of the season, I don't know. But they've done it against Manchester City in the past and they've had success. So I imagine he'll be doing it for next week anyway. Is there a case to be made for, because we've seen other teams do it, and that's not necessarily Manchester United, uh, when you have those attacking wingbacks as they were, that they don't necessarily have to be uh, natural defenders. Like you can essentially convert, you know, notionally anyway, uh, a midfielder or a winger into to something like a wing back, whereby you have Shaw and Wan Bissaka providing the width, but defensively they have no enough to have. They have Maguire and Bay uh, covering their flanks. Uh, should things go skew with, like, is there a case to be made that we could end up seeing Sancho playing as something of a a, a makeshift wing back going forward? Um, I would probably say no. Because if you look at probably the best examples, or the most recent one would be Chelsea. Chelsea's centre-back pairings, you know, the outside ones, not the middle centre-half, tend to have pace. Mm. And if, 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 if that player doesn't have pace, then that area can be a mass. You can expose it, and that's the weak point, is dragging a centre-half out of position. You look at all the great centre-halves that have played in the Premier League from your John Terry's to Rio Ferdinand's, you hardly ever seen them defending in wide areas. Everything was kind of through the middle. Um, Manchester United... You look at them, Rafa Varane is probably the quickest of the four of them, uh, probably followed by Eric Bailly. Like Harry Maguire, I've played with Harry. Harry's very comfortable comfortable on the ball, but he will get exposed for pace out in the wide areas. Um, so, like, would you want to Jaden Sancho in that, you know, right wing back spot? I wouldn't. Okay, against lesser opposition where he's probably not going to have to track back as much, you could probably get away with it. But against good opposition, um, like a top six side or whatever, you... you there's going to be times when you're pinned in and are you going to rely on Jaden Sancho to cover in that area? I don't think so. Well, so yeah, um, uh, Ireland make their squad for sorry for uh, for the Portugal game Thursday and that's what, what he's talking about, David's talking about there um, in relation to Chelsea and their, the, 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 the two players kind of on the left. That was all over Ireland's decision making when Omobi Medele came on against Portugal because he has that pace and that was all Anthony Barry who's obviously coming from Chelsea and now here we are in the reverse fixture and Omobi Medele has become something of a cult hero and he was thrown into the, the lion's den I'm almost certain this David at that time exactly because of what you, you're you saying there he has that pace on the right hand side to deal with players coming in and, and kind of almost become an auxiliary fullback when needed Well if you remember um, I think like because you brought up Anthony Barry, there was a there was a very good one um, with Chelsea. If you remember, I think it was they're playing Leicester, but they had been playing Aspilicueta, um on the right of the three centre backs, and they had Reese James as the wing back. But then they swapped them because Reese James would be faster. It was because Vardy, as you know, likes to appear in those pockets with the pace, and he just shuffled out his his space because Reese James could keep up with him. And it is something that's very important in those centre backs. They've got to be very comfortable in dealing. You know, with defenders one on one. That's why you do see a lot more, set, like say, fullbacks kind of go back into those areas. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Juan Basaka ended up getting pushed inside if they were short for cover because he'd be able to deal with it. Luke Shaw would be able to slot in naturally. But when you're talking about bringing like wingers back, like you look at Chelsea have done it with Hudson Odoi, um, probably another great example Chelsea have used is Marcus Alonso. He's brilliant at getting forward. You remember back under Conte, he probably got, I don't know, probably eight or ten goals. I don't know off the top of my head how many exactly. But he always seemed to be in and around the box. But then once Frank came in you know, and, and took the reins and he pushed him into a fullback, he just got massively exposed because he's not a fantastic defender, but he's very good at going forward. 
Yeah, the same could be said, I guess, of, uh, of, of Trent Alexander-Arnold when he's been exposed in terms of uh, his defensive work. I'm just, in terms of the midfield dynamics, because it's obviously an area that you would have operated in a fair bit yourself, how different does this midfield operate whereby you've got McTominay and Pogba versus, uh, say, a Fred and McTominay or you know, a, a, a Matic and McTominay, whereby their, their job is to screen, whereas these two guys' job is to essentially try and uh, pick the ball up off the defence and, and play forward? It's going to be interesting um, because, look, I played I played with Hull, albeit it's not the same as Manchester United. I played in Hull in a back five. Uh, we played one sitting and two in front. Uh, we had Tom Huddleston as the sitting midfielder who never, Tom was never going to bomb forward. He was just a conductor. Um, you know what I mean? He just sat and got on the ball and was able to spray it round, hit every club in the bag. I look at United now tonight, like there's no doubting Pogba has that range of passing as well. But who's the one that's going to be able to arc just arc the midfield to be able to allow, you know, Bruno to do what he wants or Pogba if he's going to join it. Because McTominay does have an engine and he he's a ball carrier. He likes to get into people's faces. He likes to be on the front foot pressing, you know, winning second balls, tackling. They've got to find that balance. Now, that's going to be very difficult because there there are, you know, Pogba, we've, we've highlighted in the past, his positions at times, you know, his defensive duties... He should be able to get away with it, but that's where McTominay needs to be clever, just to hold the station and hold the midfield so it allows Pogba to go and be creative, go, you know, take someone on, get into a wide area, create a chance for Bruno, Ronaldo, whoever it may be, because you know Bruno is going to be the one that's going to be appearing in between the lines, getting on the half turn, playing forward. So if Pogba joins him up with him, then McTominay has to be defensively solid and he can't be charging forward, trying to... You know, pick up loose balls or trying to get into the box to score a goal because they'll just leave the middle of the pitch wide open. Go, considering what's ahead at the weekend and, and the fact that it is Manchester City and the Derby and, and the true asset test, I guess, of, of where Solskjaer finds himself as a manager at the moment, how important is tonight in terms of the Solskjaer progress? Because, you know, Saturday was a nice building block, albeit, as we mentioned, with the giant caveat that Spurs were an absolutely nothing team. Atlanta are a different prospect as you found out a fortnight ago. No, definitely. Um, I think it's just... It, the uproar from the Liverpool game was so big that, look, you never want to see or you never want to call for someone to lose their job. But there was a lot of fans that were unhappy. It just kind of felt, look, Ollie's brought us as far as he can. He's not he's not as tactically inev- in- incapable of the other managers that are out there that, you know, there was question marks. Could we go and get a, a, a bigger manager like a Conte? No, they turned the corner... Um, but how many times have we said that? How many times have, has Ali been able to pull out a result where it kind of papers over the cracks and then, you know, in four or six weeks' time, um, they're back at square one? He needs to find a level of consistency with them. You know, if they go and win tonight, great. Then they can go into the Man City game. But if they're not, like if they go and have a disappointing result, then it's just going to be back to square one right after the Liverpool game. So it is really important that those players go and respond in the correct manner in which they did the other day follow it up with a good performance and a good result tonight because, you know, they're one step away from qualifying. They get that done, then they can prepare for Manchester City, which, like we know, is going to be a total, total different game. Yeah. David Moyle, thanks so much uh, for taking time out to speak to us tonight. Manchester United away to Atalanta from 8pm in the Champions League. David De Gea starts in goal for them. Back three, then of Eric Bailly, Rafa Varane, Harry Maguire with Aaron wan and Luke Shaw providing the width. Scott McTominay, Paul Pogba are in midfield and Bruno Fernandes sits in behind a front two of Cristiano Ronaldo and Marcus Rashford. Damien Delaney will talk us through, I guess, how that game is uh, unfolding during the football show after 9pm. We'll also speak to Luke Edwards about the impending Unai Emery appointment, it seems, at Newcastle anyway. And up after 8 o'clock as well, we'll be talking Claire GAA and all of our football on OTB is brought to you by Sky. Watch every UEFA Champions League and Europa League match live on BT Sport this season. Back after these. Off the ball on News Talk. Project Green with Bobby Kerr. Project Green is a brand new podcast series where we explore sustainability within businesses and discuss the steps industries are taking to reduce their carbon footprint. This week it's all about agriculture. We'll be hearing from PJ McCarthy, Chief Executive of Renewable Gas Forum Ireland, Hannah Daly, Lecturer in Sustainable Energy and Energy Systems Modelling at University College Cork, and Darren McCullough, a farmer at Elm Grove Farm up there in County Mead. 
Project Green with Bobby Kerr. A new podcast series from News Talk with thanks to ESB Networks. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now at Newstalk.com or the News Talk app powered by Go Loud. The famous Holland and Barrett One Cent Sale is back with buy one, get one for just one cent on vitamin D, Manuka honey, natural skincare, and much more. And you can even mix and